Welcome back to MSU Today. We're joined uh, by Jeff Dwyer, uh, the director of MSU's Extension Services. Uh, Jeff has been a longtime MSU employee. And Jeff, you've been in a number of really interesting roles over the years that, that brought you uh, uh, in a somewhat circuitous route to extension. Uh, tell us, yeah, as, a, as a starting point, a little bit about your career at MSU, where you've been and what you've done. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. Yeah, I've uh, been with Michigan State University since 2006. I had the chance to come and join uh, Marsha Rapley, then the uh, had just become the dean of the College of Human Medicine, and her team there uh, in uh, May of 2006 is the associate dean for research, and eventually, uh, shortly after that, became the senior associate dean for outreach and uh, for Senior Associate Dean for Research and Community Engagement, um, and uh, was really fortunate for a decade. While I had that title for most of that decade, uh, as as you recall, Bill, so much was going on in in the College of Human Medicine and at the University around health. We had the chance to build the Secius Center. Uh, I worked for a number of years helping to prepare the public health environment in Flint, which has now been doing very very well. Uh, and then helped to recruit a number of faculty in Grand Rapids that eventually, uh, as of a couple of years ago, filled a research building there. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been an extraordinary growth in the College of Human Medicine, and uh, and you were really uh, a part of so much of that. I was uh, I was blessed to be part of the college in the early two thousands and uh, at the very beginning of that that work in Grand Rapids, and I don't think anybody uh, could have imagined how uh, how amazing it would be and how much that uh, how much that would just really explode as a campus and then on the heels of that the work that you and Marsha did in Flint to begin to really you know, we, we've been in Flint, Flint for many many decades but to uh, uh, to, to really take that and uh, and and have that ex- you know, just really uh, sort of grow exponentially um, in terms of, of public health mission and then, you know, and, and then I think you know, that that sort of uh, uh, you know, we had the good fortune to be well prepared to deal with uh, and to, to help the city work through the issues related to the water crisis there. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, it's just I think a good example of the you know the extraordinary work that that Michigan does in a uh, the Michigan State University does in a a really boots on the ground kind of way. Well, I couldn't agree more, Bill, and, and your mention of the Flint water crisis, I think, is a good segue then into how I and when I became, uh, had the privilege of becoming the director of MSU Extension. Uh, but when uh, Tom Kuhn uh, went on to take a vice president role at Oklahoma State University, uh, and and they were looking for someone to take on that role, I uh, had the opportunity uh, through uh, a longstanding and uh, uh, long-term uh, friendship and 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 uh, working relationship with Doug Bueller became aware that um, that might be an opportunity, and we talked about that with with uh, the two of us and with others as well. Uh, and it and it seemed like a good match. A lot of people thought, "Huh, this is odd." A sociologist who has spent the last decade in a College of Human Medicine with extension, and and I think a number of people were. Uh, sort of wondering how all of that worked, but I think it all comes down to the connection to the community, and and Flint's a good example of that because, as you said, I spent so many years uh, on the College of Human Medicine side, helping to prepare the way for what Deborah Verholden and others are now doing uh, in Flint so effectively. Um, and I actually took on this role in extension right when the Flint water crisis became so public, and actually. Uh, within the first couple of weeks, um, uh, dug in and we were able to uh, focus the, our people that were already working in Flint and Genesee County. And over that first year or so, uh, we nearly doubled the number of people we had working in Flint uh, because of the importance of the things that we were doing there around nutrition and around uh, working with youth and many, many other things. So, Jeff, one of the great points of pride for Michigan State University is our impact on the people of the state of Michigan. And 
there are there are many colleges that that impact the state in a broad way. Uh, you know, thinking back to our experience in the College of Human Medicine, uh, the College of Osteopathic Medicine, both of our medical schools have students that uh, that train and uh, and and engage in residencies and ultimately practice throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, we uh, also have talked on this program with Ron Hendrick and some of the operations of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the impact they have throughout the state of Michigan. But really, if there was one entity that touched pretty much every corner of our state, uh, it would be MSU Extension. And could you tell us a little bit about the, the work that, that the different kinds of things that Extension does really in, in literally every county of the state of Michigan. Yeah, you're right, Bill. We, we do work in all 83 counties in the state. And I believe as we talked this morning, I have people living in 82 of those 83 counties. The only one we, I think, don't have someone a resident of right now is Keweenaw County, way up in the northern reaches of the Upper Peninsula. And, and I think that's important because uh, uh, the way we are able to reach uh, literally potentially all residents of the state of Michigan it is because we have this hundred plus year history and people know us and people expect us to be there. We're, we're truly embedded in communities. And so uh, I have 600, uh, a little north of 600 faculty and staff all over the state. And they're not just doing a job there, but uh, they're sitting in the pew at church with people, they're at the grocery store, they're, they're, they're often elected uh, to roles in their city or township or county. Uh, and so they're really an embedded part of the communities in addition uh, to bringing the resources of a great land grant university, Michigan State University to that community. One of the things we talk about, Bill, that, that is really true is uh, that for many of my uh, folks, they may be the only Michigan State University that people know in their community. And so I really view that as a two-way street in that they're responsible for bringing um, uh, the, the, the research and the programming and opportunities of a great land-grant university to a particular community, but they're also uh, responsible for making sure that those of us who are sort of uh, uh, based more on campus, whether we're with Extension or, or with some other part of the university. They're responsible for making sure that we know what's going on in the communities that they work in. And so in that sense, I really think about our staff and Extension uh, as being sentinels in the public health sense of sentinels, that they really know what's going on in communities. They really know uh, what we need to be paying attention to um, and, and that has been important in our ability to address many, many different uh, uh, topics and issues and emerging issues of importance around the state. We work in a broad, the other thing that's unique to us is we work in so many different areas. So we work in agriculture and that's been a big part of our history. Uh, we work uh, with children and youth and certainly 4-H with over 200,000 youth and 4-H is a big part of not only what we do today, but our history. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that we also have substantial uh, programming and research in health and nutrition. Um, we have over a hundred uh, um, uh, certified nurse instructors uh, who provide SNAP ed services around the state. We have people who do diabetes education and mental health first aid and a variety of other things. And then we also have a whole group that's focused on working with communities around strategic development around um, how to do everything from run meetings better uh, to, to take stock of what the needs of their community are and how to bring jobs and how to be connected to state services and all of those other sorts of things. And so one of the things I like to, to use as a reference is I like to think that, that there's an element of us that's sort of like uh, what you see on Amazon when you go and buy a book, where if you buy a book, often you see that band at the bottom that says, people who bought this book also bought this book or that book or, or another book. And I like to think that the range of our services, over 200 programs as we speak, uh, is such that if we're, if we're working with a youth in 4-H, 
we should be thinking about what other programs do we offer or partners do we work with that would benefit this youth or their family or their community. Uh, and that's that's kind of how we work. Now that's that's a, a really great analogy. And I think that, you know, for many that are familiar with Michigan State University, when one mentions the, the words MSU extension, uh, one tends to go to uh, what were the roots of, of our extension, uh, and, and that's t- tied largely to agriculture. But as you say, uh, extension has developed over the years into a very, very different kind of organization that uh, does agricultural uh, support work, but but also does so, so much more. And I came to learn of that uh, during my time working with, uh, with the president and the board of trustees when we uh, visited the city of Detroit and learned about all of the things that MSU Extension was doing uh, in the city of Detroit uh, for, you know, for the, the, the residents of, of that community. And, uh, uh, and, and while there were some, some agricultural threads through things like uh, supporting uh, the work that was going on with community gardens, it was really so much more and uh, uh, and so comprehensive that uh, it it I think was would be surprising to people to learn about so so much that goes on there. But uh, let me ask you about uh, how how all of this work has been going in the context of the the pandemic we've been in. Uh, it's a great question and and. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that it's certainly been different, but I think we've been no less effective. And and really, Bill, we have the metrics to show that we're reaching more people than ever before. And so uh, when the stay home, stay safe executive order went, uh, uh, came into being in March, uh, our people went home. as did virtually everyone else at the university, and began to work from home, uh, in most cases, in a new way. Within six days, we had uh, a a new website launch that we called uh, the Remote Learning and Resources website. Uh, And and that was uh, initially put there to provide interactive virtual opportunities for education and support and information Uh, of many different kinds. So uh, helping parents keep their children on track while learning at home, Uh, an extensive list of online programs for adults from um, cabin fever conversations uh, and information so that people could start thinking about their gardens, for example, while back in March, we were pretty much still cooped up at home. Uh, We had a calendar of virtual events, um, educational videos, uh, uh, stress, mindfulness, yoga opportunities for people. And so we worked really hard to take everything that we did uh, in more traditional settings um, uh, and and get it online as quickly as we could. I I referred to metrics a moment ago and uh, prior to uh, the pandemic, we uh, in a typical month uh, would get somewhere between eight and 900,000 visitors to our website every single month. And and people might say, wow, that's a lot. How does that work? Well, it works because we have over 30,000 pieces of evidence-based content on a whole host of topics on our website. And so what happens is sometimes people know to come directly to our website, but our data shows that only about 3% of visitors to our website come through the homepage. The typical way they get to us is they Google something like nutrition or uh, home brewing or uh, uh, hunting or fishing or something like that. And we are one of the top things that pop up on the, the, the internet search, the Google search, whatever they're using, uh, and they come in that way. So prior to the pandemic, we were getting 800 to 900,000 vis- visitors. Uh, a few weeks in, we reached 1.4 million visitors to our website every month. And since uh, about May, June, we've been averaging about one and a quarter million visitors. So that's one uh, piece of evidence that we, um, 
we know uh, that we're, we're reaching more people, but also in areas, uh, even areas typically in agriculture where the programming was, was historically done all in person and we were forced to move things virtually. Uh, we not only got better attendance during the live events because they were often in the evening, people didn't need to drive, they didn't need to be away from their farms or their planting or whatever for quite such a long period of time, but also because we were able to archive those live opportunities, then many, many other people um, uh, came. So we have, for example, uh, this isn't an agriculture reference necessarily, but we have um, live food safety uh, experiences every week uh, that eventually uh, reach more than 50,000 people around the world. And so it's really been an amazing opportunity to think about how we convey the information that we have uh, uh, in, in new and different ways. Our people, many of our people are becoming quite um, sophisticated uh, video developers and, and online uh, video uh, training, uh, doing online trainings and things like that. Um, and, and we're very excited because we think what happens is we all um, are able to go back to something that looks a little more like normal, Bill, is that in extension, we can't go back all the way to the way it was because we've learned too much and we've learned how to reach more people and we've learned how to use our skills in different ways. And so we imagine that the future of MSU extension will actually be a hybrid uh, more of a hybrid of some of the in-person programming that we used to do that we're anxious to get back to, uh, while also continuing to do some of the virtual uh, programming that has been so impactful. Well, and I think that's one of the things that many of us have discovered in this this pandemic uh, and in how we how we respond to it. You know, it's it's amazing to me that you know, in talking with a number of our deans. And even my experience in the athletic department that, you know, there are things we've done that uh, have actually increased our reach and, and in significant ways. Uh, and uh, so while we may go back to some of the, uh, the, the ways that we did things in the past, you know, thinking about how we, uh, how we maintain that increased reach and, and how we, uh, you know, continue to, uh, to try and touch the lives of so many people that we've been able to do through electronic means and figuring out how to how to sort of marry the past with the future and uh, and and learn those lessons uh, is is really really important and it's exciting to hear that that you're having that that same experience. It, one of the things that uh, I think uh, yeah, that that I've heard that Extension has also been able to help with is the development of uh, the PPE supply as part of the pandemic. Yeah, that's been uh, really a remarkable opportunity for us. And I think, Bill, it, it highlights the fact that, and I'm just you know very proud of the fact, and as I said at the outset, it's a privilege for me to be in this role because we have really outstanding creative people. And uh, I would say that we uh, uh, were able, have been able, continue to have an impact uh, in at least three different ways. Early on, uh, we were, I think, positioned very well in communities throughout the state, including on campus and in the Lansing region, by the way, in uh, being a part of collecting PPE and getting it out to the health providers that truly needed it in those early days. Interestingly, some of the PPE that the, that the health providers most needed is not uncommon in the agricultural industry uh, for those, for example, who apply pesticides or do other sorts of things where they might need an N95 mask uh, or a gown uh, or a face shield. And so um, uh, I, I think we were well positioned on and off campus to become a collection point as well as uh, getting those uh, uh, the, 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 the PPE out where it needed to be to healthcare providers. We were also part of what really became uh, uh, just a really substantial effort by many on campus to actually make face shields that really helped uh, 
uh, hospitals and healthcare environments, especially over those first two or three months, March, April, May, when they were so hard to get, uh, uh, it was hard to get your hands on face shields in other ways. And so making them with equipment that people already had in their labs uh, was was uh, very important. Um, so, so I think that that's one very early example. A, a, a second that I'm just so proud of, and that you and others perhaps have have read some about is, uh, and, and I'll tell you the just brief little story because I think it says so much about Michigan State University Extension. But frankly, it says a great deal about Michigan State University and the kind of place that it is. But uh, we have a new food processing innovation center uh, just north of 96 uh, in Okemos, just a bit off of the MSU campus. And um, uh, shortly after the stay home, stay safe order, um, we were um, doing uh, we were using that site as a site for the collection and, and distribution of PPE. And I was walking through it with a couple of our, our folks uh, who are just expert at, at food processing and, and related things. And, and one of them said, uh, Tina Conklin said, you know, uh, often heat is used to decontaminate. I wonder if we could decontaminate personal protection equipment in our spiral oven. And within 24 hours, we were able to uh, uh, call upon experts at uh, our partner at, at Sparrow Hospital uh, who walked the facility with us. Uh, and, and, and this is where I think, you know, I say the kind of place Michigan State University is because Sparrow Hospital is not a historical partner of Michigan State University Extension but it is a historical partner of Michigan State University and particularly the health colleges. And so those relationships really helped us uh, to make that partnership early on. And, and that's really developed into um, uh, where we, we did develop a protocol for uh, decontaminating um, um, uh, N95 masks. That's very effective. We've done substantial testing and uh, we remain in a FDA process for gaining emergency authorization for the use of dry heat for the decontamination of N95 masks. And so um, that's, that's something that if you just said to me a year ago, hey, you're gonna, MSU Extension is gonna be decontaminating N95 masks, I would have said, you're crazy. That's, that just wouldn't ever be on our radar. And yet we have these talented creative people who are always thinking about how to use the resources and relationships available to us. And then I'll quickly mention the third thing, Bill, is we've, we've just completed in recent weeks uh, a process. Uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation uh, has done a really nice job of finding suppliers for PPE and trying to marry those suppliers uh, to those who needed the PPE. And uh, one of the issues they were having is they're so busy uh, that they didn't have enough people to literally make the calls to the businesses to see uh, if they needed PPE, whether it's a dental office or any kind of a business. And so we were able to uh, 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 transition some of our staff for a period of weeks who eventually have made over 3,500 calls to businesses all over the state of Michigan uh, to determine their need for PPE and to make them aware of those suppliers uh, in Michigan, especially, but outside if needed, uh, that might be able to assist with that need. So those are just three examples of, of things that we would not typically have thought of ourselves doing, but because of our statewide footprint, because of our embeddedness in communities, and because of the talented people that we have uh, willing to jump in uh, really on a moment's notice and, and address emerging issues, uh, we've been able to play a key role, I believe. Well, Jeff, that that really speaks to the, you know, the adaptability of MSU Extension, the problem solving ability, and and just you, you and your team, you know, your your willingness to, to to take on whatever we you know, really whatever comes our way as as a state as as a set of communities, and and figure out how to make uh, our communities better. Uh, 
for the people of the state of Michigan. And from my perspective, at least that's when I talk to our student athletes, I, I, I talk about a Spartan being a person who makes their corner of the world a better place. And there are a few exa- few few examples of that that are better than than MSU extension. So, um, as we as we wrap up today, I always uh, enjoy talking uh, with with the guests we have on the program. We discuss so many uh, meaty issues, but but I like to end with a question that uh, maybe is a little more on the fun side. And uh, as the as the head of our extension programs. Uh, you know, as we've talked about, they're really in, in all 83 counties of the state of Michigan. And so, you know, your job requires a lot of getting around and seeing things and, and working with people uh, crisscrossing the state. So is there a, a favorite place uh, in the state of Michigan that you like to visit? <laughs> it's a great question. And, and Bill, I'm just going to amplify your emphasis on the 83 counties, because in the summer of 2019, um, over a 14-week period, uh, I spent uh, two days each of those 14 weeks in each of our 14 districts. And while in each district, I was in every county. So over 14 weeks in the summer of 2019, I was in all 83 counties in the state of Michigan. And I'll tell you, not just being in the counties, but driving all over the state in a constrained period of time like that, uh, you really do gain an appreciation for what an amazing state this is and what an amazing role uh, Michigan State University has in the state of Michigan. And, and I'm going to cheat on your question a little bit, and I'm going to say that my favorite place in the state of Michigan uh, is Alger County up in the Upper Peninsula, where the pictured rocks are. And that's because, as, as you and a few others know, Bill, that's where uh, my wife Nancy and I have made our home since 2003. Uh, throughout my entire time in the College of Human Medicine and Michigan State University, I've commuted from there. And uh, it's just such a, uh, an amazing, beautiful part of the state. Um, and, and, and one of the things we like about it is that it's a, it's a small community, less than 10,000 in the whole county. So we really know a lot of people very well. But it's also a county that now draws, in a typical summer, almost a million visitors. So we get to see a wide range of people, uh, mostly during the summertime and really get a sense of of those who are traveling in Michigan during that period of time. But then we also have a substantial period of time uh, in the fall, winter and spring to spend with our friends and neighbors there. And then we have the privilege of being connected to Michigan State University at the same time. So it's really been uh, an amazing couple of decades. Well, Jeff, I, uh, as a person who loves travel myself, have spent some time up in, in the Upper Peninsula at the uh, uh, Pictured Rocks and uh, to Quamanon Falls, and then uh, and then heading heading west to to some of the other the, uh, the other parts of our great state, and uh, uh, and I, I certainly can can vouch for that. It is a uh, it is a wonderful part of America. So uh, we want to thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, again, our, our guest has been Jeff Dwyer, who is the head of the MSU's extension programs throughout Michigan's 83 counties. And uh, uh, in, in each and every one of those counties doing the great work of Michigan State University uh, to make those communities better places. And, uh, and, and as one of uh, Jeff, one of our former leaders said, uh, you know, MSU is a great assist leader. Uh, we don't need to score the points. We we really like to make the assist to help people make things happen in their communities. And so it's that arm in arm partnership that is so prevalent in extension that I think is is so much of what makes Michigan State a very special place. And so thank you for your role in that. And thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Bill. It's been a pleasure.